Thomas and a co-founder of DataFab. I'm Erin Tenney. I'm a senior associate at Mass Economics and DataFab. Yes, we both work at Mass Economics, which is an economics and research consulting firm based out of Cambridge, Mass. Also at um, DataFab, which is an economic data firm. So today we're here to talk about economic data, some of the challenges with um, the various data sources, a little bit about our approaches to addressing uh, economic data issues, and then we're going to end sort of providing some examples uh, from the frameworks and applications uh, that are based on some of this improved economic data. So first off, just uh, an overview of some of the existing economic data sources and, uh, and their limitations. So here you have this big table. Um, I want to call out that at the top are the two key data sources that are available at the six-digit NAICS code level. There's about a thousand of those industries, and that level of detail is often necessary for a whole slew of economic analyses, both academic and applied. Um, they're used for you know, definitions of both existing and new industry clusters, and they can also be pretty critical when you're getting into detailed strategy development. Um, so both of those data sources are available at the county level, of which there are about 3.1K, 3,100 counties in the entire U.S. Um, and then going down to these bottom three data sources um, that are related, um, but you can see have a a little bit less industry detail. So there's this quarterly workforce indicators data set um, that's available at a four-digit NAICS code level. That's only about 300 different industries. Um, it's also available at the county level, um, and it's also available quarterly, um, like, as the name suggests, the quarterly census of employment and wages data set. Um, these last two um, are really sort of for micro-level geographies. Uh, so there's this LEHD OTM data source, and it's available at the census block level, which is really small, there's about 11 million of them across the US. But uh, the real trade off there is you only get about 20 industry uh, sectors. So, not a very detailed uh, profile of the employment. And then lastly, you have um, a variety of private firm level vendors. Um, Name a couple of them there, YTF, Net, Hoover, uh, Dun & Bradstreet. And uh, so those are point level, um, and they do generally cover all uh, 1,000 six-digit NAICS codes. Um, but you'll see in the next slide, right, there are some challenges with that one. So moving on to how do we actually use these data sources, um, the first two, um, which are really the core of uh, economic analyses, you can see that CDP uh, has a couple more cross tabs than QCW, but that lag hurts. Uh, it can be one and a half years to about two and a half years behind the present day. And then you compare that to QCW data set where, hey, you're only six months back, which is near real time. Um, another new distinguishing factor is uh, that the CDP data, um, while they used to be a great data source, they uh, recently changed their, their reporting practices, and sadly, it's really made the data set almost unusable. And um, quickly, the issue is just you can no longer distinguish between what's a zero and what's just suppressed. You just don't even know what's in there anymore. Um, so then CCW. Yes, there are more suppressions uh, than what county business patterns used to provide, but the nice thing is you can solve them, and we'll get to that a little bit later in this, uh, in this presentation. Um, then QWI, right, so you said a related uh, data set, right, QWI is great because it offers a lot of interesting cross tabs uh, that really help you get an inclusion and equity concerns like the age, sex, race, educational attainment, um, but also they get at some of the sort of more entrepreneurship-related uh, indicators like firm age and firm size. Um, OTM, there's that, there's that painful lag time. I think it's still currently only at 2018, so, you know, 2021, almost 2022, and 
you know, almost years back now. Um, but this is really useful because it connects residents to their place of work. You can get into all sorts of sort of uh, commuter flow pattern analytics. And again, since it's such a small census block geography, you can do uh, this quick high level corridor and neighborhood um, level analysis and get a quick understanding of what's going on in this street or that district. Um, and then private vendor data, you know, it's point level. It's often rolling, you know, continuous. You can get a snapshot of the economy last week. Uh, but the real problem there is you just have a lot of data errors and issues to address. So we do a lot of QA. Um, you'll have duplicate entries, um, locations can be wrong, you know, in the wrong, on the wrong street, on the wrong zip code even, um, misclassified firms in the wrong industry. Um, and then, of course, just employment errors where is it 100 employees or is it 10? Sometimes have that level of uh, errors there. But as we'll see a little bit later, um, the, the geographic resolution offered by those private vendor data sets um, can be really, uh, be really great and combined with some of the more reliable data sets that we trust. Yeah, so as Tom mentioned, um, basically there's sort of a, as, as he was moving down the table, there's kind of a trade-off between geographic detail and data availability. Um, and so typically, um, you know, just in terms of spatializing this, outside of the large metro areas, at least it, it's typical that at least one-fifth of industry employment is suppressed. And so this is just under 40% of the total U.S. employment. And um, this, unfortunately, creates a big barrier to conducting really detailed analyses in rural or non-metro areas. And then another look uh, is actually now specifically the QWI data set, but you're going to see a pretty similar pattern. Um, you know, if you're looking at that map on the previous slide, you might guess that those are pretty rural areas, and a lot of those might have pretty low employment. Um, on the left-hand table here, what you're seeing is just, yeah, um, the number of counties that are suppressed broken out by the number of jobs. So as you go down to fewer and fewer jobs in the county, as you might guess, right, you got a lot more suppression. Um, and on the right-hand side, another factor that comes into play with suppressions is as you do more and more cross-tabulation, um, yeah, you're more and more likely to run into suppression issues. Um, and you can see over here on the right that, you know, hey, if you care about uh, Developing an understanding of African American employment in a county or, or African American trends in a region, even, you're going to run into a lot of suppressions um, in the sort of raw data, um, you know, up to about a quarter of your job, um, sorry, a quarter of your county is not going to know what's going on for that demographic. Um, suppressions also have a disproportionate impact on certain industries. Um, so the utility sector, what we're showing here on this chart is basically the percent of 60 county industry employment that's suppressed. And as you can see, the utility sector is um, by far the most suppressed sector with 89% of its total employment suppressed. Um, manufacturing is the second most suppressed sector. Um, and it's, it's about 10% of the total economy and nearly two thirds of its employment is suppressed. And this is all compared to the total economy of about 22 22% of employment being suppressed. This lag, along with the previously discussed um, gutting of CBP, highlights um, how QCW is a pretty, uh, definitely a, a preferred source over CBP. Now we're going to. Um and into sort of some of the new approaches we developed around economic data. Um, and just a little bit of background um, will help out with this. Uh, so DataFab uh, was created by practitioners, that is mass economic staff, to provide high quality, reasonably priced um, economic data on cities and regions. Um, you see there also, right, we eventually um, built out demographic and financial data as well. Um, but really, as uh, Aaron mentioned earlier, right, sort of our core product is around using QCW data. Then over the course of years of, of research and development where we develop the algorithms that can solve all of the suppressions in QCW, 
across all the all across all counties and all industries. And since then, we've sort of applied these techniques and algorithms to a whole variety of other data sets, um, be it agriculture related or occupations or the uh, previously mentioned PWI data set. Um, so, in applying all these algorithms, um, what's great is that we basically, in math economics, we used to sometimes spend up to a third of project time and budget solving these same data issues again and again and again before you even get to the interesting part around the analysis and the strategy development. Uh, so, as a result, um, first, math economics developed through the small in house research team. This was mostly devoted to solving these economic data issues and math for all the industries and all the counties systematically in one go. Um, and while that process was great and was able to feed math economics lots of great data and sort of reduce the budget and time constraints and costs for all of our various consulting projects, we also realized that we realized the value of this data um, went beyond just math economics and it made sense to spin out data fab uh, as its own company completely devoted to the creation of economic data and the application of these tools to other data sets as well. And so by using all available data, um, we've really been able to maximize the quality of the data that we're, we're putting out and using in our analyses. Um, so this slide is showing the distribution of industry by absolute percent error, and this is, for example, um, from California. Um, and so basically, our data is, um, it, it, we're able to really minimize our error. The vast majority of our industry geography errors are less than 0.1%. Um, so this is a significant improvement over the market leader. And so our data also has a shorter tail compared to the market leaders. Right, so now we're going to pivot a little bit. Um, having solved all the suppressions and building out all of this six digit level data for all the counties for 20 years of data, um, we've now been able to sort of leverage all of that, uh, all that data to develop new frameworks, new applications. So we're going to sort of burn through a couple of um, examples of some of our new frameworks and uh, some of these sort of uh, cross pollination. Um, to create new data entirely. So starting off just with a couple of new frameworks. Um, first is starting off with market areas. And the, traditionally, um, the economy has been broken into local and traded. Um, um, there's like clusters. And once we build out all this data, what we realize is there's actually a third category so it's in between uh, the local and traded, which we call regional. And really, um, next slide is highlighting how it is a distinct uh, market area between traded and local. So traded, you can see on the bottom is that huge blue uh, circle, and that has a you know, huge market area. Now there's fewer traded firms you know, per geography. Um, so that circles over 200X regional circle there, um, which really mostly is at a MSA, or as the name suggests, regional level. Um, and then region, the regional market area in turn is about 2x the size of that local market area, which is really a lot of uh, the sort of neighborhood level, you know, bodegas and uh, industries we're going to see across almost everywhere across the U.S. Um, just a really quick profile um, of local versus regional versus traded. And specifically want to call out that this regional cluster has really strong rates of uh, MBE and WBE ownership. And then it also offers wages that are you know, dramatically higher than local, and they're almost the same as traded, 75K versus 81K. Um, these market areas also offer a really important 
lens and kind of foundation for understanding broader economic trends too. Um, so this chart is showing job growth from January 2019 to March 2021, indexed to January 2019. Um, and so this is kind of showing the impact of COVID um, by market area. Local industries were extremely hard hit in April, as you can see, um, down about 20%, nearly 20% from January 2019 levels. Um, but the recovery has been fairly promising. Traded industries, on the other hand, were not the hardest hit, but recovery has not been as robust um, as we saw in local industries. And regional industries, um, shown in the purple, were, um, it's not that they were unscathed by COVID, but they fared much better um, than the local and traded industries. And then also just to give you an example of how this plays out in local economies, um, this slide is showing data for Danville, Virginia, um, using the market areas to understand its economic trajectory compared to the U.S. Um, and so these types of analyses are really informative for strategy development. Um, as we've called out on this chart, um, from March to December 2020, regional industries added jobs, um, but nationally, actually, regional industries lost jobs during this period. Also wanted to just call out that, um, as you can see in the, the traded industries, um, traded industries um, did slightly lose jobs in Daniel during this period, but this was, you know, nothing um, on the scale of what happened in the U.S. overall. So just important insights that we can, we can you know, bring to um, strategy development. Well, I'm going to quickly highlight another, um, one other framework that we were able to develop um, by leveraging the detailed economic data. Um, and a very quick overview of sort of methodologically, we basically took about 18,000 tasks that were associated with, and we assigned those to the occupation and cross of those to industries to develop the sort of stages of innovation framework. That goes from ideation, where you're sort of research and development stage. You can see some of the occupations and industries um, within the ideation stage. So then prototyping, where you're sort of really figuring out how to even just make one. Um, so then commercialization, where you're then figuring out how to legally um, get that product to market. Uh, then finally to scaling, uh, where you're figuring out how to take, you know, Produce unit one and then scale that up to 10,000, 100,000 units, however it might be, and really just grow that business. Um, and then finally, there's this routine operations and management, which is really outside of the stages of innovation, but that's sort of, you made it and you're just posting along, you're producing products and selling products or services, and um, most of the economy falls in that group. But then when you can apply this stage of innovation framework at different scales, you can learn a lot about an economy. Um, so on the right hand side, this is sort of looking nationally, um, you can see sort of different MSAs, but you can just see how ideation activity on the x-axis is associated with sort of the later stages of innovation. And also just wanted to call out this is outlier look alley here where you have a really robust uh, stages of innovation following after the ideation stage. Um, on the left hand side, this is just sort of showing Toledo, uh, Ohio, and uh, Lucas County. Um, what pop is being extremely strong in prototyping. So that sort of carried downstream some of our strategy development around becoming a prototyping hub and then building out um, related activities and also. Um, uh, and uses and um, real estate space to support that prototyping activity. Um, so next, we're going to pivot to really the understanding of um, some of those sort of COVID times, real time trends that are possible with uh, QCW six month lag and the monthly granularity of the data. So with more granular time series data, we've been able to get, um, to, to really maximize our insights around peaks and troughs in industries um, and just get a better sense of what's happening in terms of the employment volatility in a local economy. 
what we're showing in this slide is employment for um, a county in Colorado and then incorporated towns and unincorporated areas in Colorado. And just highlighting um, the peaks and troughs in January and July. Um, and so this is really another kind of important um, uh, analytical you know, tool in our toolbox in terms of developing strategies to support part-time workers in these areas. And then similarly, we can apply similar like methods to um, assessing COVID trends. So here we're showing um, index employment growth in um, the um, MSAs with the top or like the highest March to December 2020 growth and then the lowest March to December 2020 growth among the top 10 MSAs for each cluster. Um, and so what this kind of reveals is that um, there's, this gives us, you know, an understanding of sort of the real-time impacts of COVID-19, but it's clear from analyses like these, you know, just how dramatic the impact on different clusters has been. Um, and so the clusters on top have diverged the most, um, you know, and, and we see like with e-commerce, there's been really explosive growth in, um, you know, the top MSA, not so much in um, the, the um the lower um, growth MSAs. Um, and then towards the bottom, the clusters have remained um, somewhat more stable. But analyses like these kind of give us a sense of ge uh, geographic reorganization that might be happening um, post COVID. Right. Um, you know, I mentioned e commerce. So, yeah, we try to be fun to do the transportation uh, from clusters and sort of their performance during COVID. Um, so you look at this chart, you know, as you might guess, um, for having read um, various articles about it, um, seeing that by air transportation and passenger transportation, extreme was top hit uh, by the impact of the COVID-19 and travel restrictions as well. You can see um, the most recent release of the PCW data, um, they're still about 15 percentage points below where they were pre-COVID. On the other hand, you that in purple, you have trucking, you can see sort of the explosive growth um, is driven by e-commerce. Um, and now it's still about 10 percentage points higher uh, than it was pre-COVID. So I'm just going to bring through a couple of quick slides to show you how this plays out um, across the U.S. So on the left hand side, just showing some of the largest metros um, with respect to the truck, right? Los Angeles with, the, with its port, um, Memphis and Indianapolis with FedEx hubs, uh, Louisville with uh, UPS hub, and then on the right, see how um, one has changed throughout uh, 2020 into 2021. Um, you can also leverage this data to look at the impacts within regions. Um, in this case, uh, you have a project in Indianapolis, so we're looking at how different counties within the region were more or less severely impacted um, by the pandemic. And you can see on the right-hand side, Marion County, which is sort of the core county containing the city of Indianapolis, uh, was pretty severely impacted, or at least comparatively to the rest of the region. And then you can see that some of these more suburban counties to the sort of west and southwest uh, are a bit better. Um, and the last point we just wanted to touch on with regard to, um, you know, timely analyses is um, something that came out during COVID about, you know, fears around the California economy um, being severely impacted by COVID um, and, you know, the impact obviously on the state, but then the implications for the uh, country. But um, when, when you kind of look at these data through, you know, not only just general job growth, but also traded industry performance in the California metros, um, what you can see is that um, actually the traded industry in um, the California metros were doing um, uh, remarkably well, um, especially considering what happened in the rest of the country. And so, so some of these fears were um, a little bit misguided. Um, and, and so, yes, yeah, another just take away from these analyses. I'm actually going to do a little uh, detour into um, a little dive into um, the development of economic data for sub-county geographies. Um, 
and really uh, is pretty much uh, done by incorporating some of the private vendor uh, firm level data, like the Dun and Bradstreet and Nets data I talked about earlier, um, but also sometimes public data sources, um, e.g., some states will provide town level um, employment data as well. But then the next step, next slide should be a little bit of a process, but you can just see on this on this graphic how important these sort of part of geographies can be, because right at an NS, at the uh, NSA level, the uh, scientific research and development services LQ is you know only 5.6. And as you zoom in uh, further and further into the city of Cambridge, you know. The LQ, and that is the concentration of that industry, is you know factors uh, again higher than in the NSA. But really, um, just nailing home the importance of sort of sub-county geographies for analytics and understanding. Um, sort of an abstract um, overview of how do we actually construct um, data for sub-county geographies, and starts with our uh, data county level data from CCW. Uh, this private vendor firm level data, all little points, uh, individual establishment, and then some, uh, one or more, whether uh, that's a specific city, neighborhood, districts, um, or specific corridors or what. Um, so the first step is you know cleaning. That's where this extensive and painful and time intensive cleaning process um, needs to occur, where you're removing duplicates. You're removing any public sector entities. Um, sometimes have to fix locations where uh, establishments might be in, you know, on the wrong street or even the wrong zip code. Um, you have to address employment issues where this firm has 10 people, 100 people, and sometimes the data get it wrong, even by that much. Um, and then also you do see industry errors where is this manufacturing, is this wholesaling, is this transportation warehousing, and having to fix those types of errors as well. Um, but then, once it's all cleaned, you can then tag um, the firm by both the county geographies and then also the sub geographies of interest. Um, and then, when you take the data that's been tagged with the respective geographies, you can then sort of nest uh, that firm level data within the QCAW data that we trust, nest it with industry specific firm level weight. And the final step is just to validate that after you've constructed this data that the light green plus the dark green plus that of geo of interest sum to the original uh, county level if it makes uh, important data. And just going to quickly burn through a couple of examples. You know, first, at this county level, um, you know, of geography, you can see how life sciences employment is concentrated along the Route 128 and 495 corridors in Massachusetts. Next, this is just showing how you can also leverage uh, the intersection of YTS and QCW data to sort of create weighted point level data. So here's sort of this heat map of innovation clusters employment across the U.S. Excuse me, across Massachusetts. Um, you can also uh, nest firm level data within slightly more custom geographies, in this case, um, an innovation district in uh, Philadelphia. And then uh, lastly, um, when you combine the QCW slash firm level data, with projections, you can sort of develop a little bit of a uh, crystal ball um, into the performance of cities, corridors, neighborhoods, um, as you see here, um, for a project we did a while back in uh, Phoenix. So last, um, last section here is gonna talk about some of our uh, applications that basically leverage the cross-pollination of different data sets. So by leveraging the algorithms and methods that we've developed um, to use with QCW, we've also been able to solve the suppressions in um, 
in other data sets too. And then by combining these this data from these different sources, we're able to generate new data on local and regional economies, um, creating these so-called functional bridges between information sources. And so shown here, um, we're, we're using a combination of QWI and QCW data that highlights the disproportionate impact of COVID on Black and African American workers and female workers in Marion County, Indiana. And this is showing job change in the um, Indianapolis MSA. Um, uh, for Marion County and the rest of the MSA from March to June 2020. Um, this is another example of our kind of functional bridges cross-pollination. Um, and, and here we're looking at average wage and um, job growth. So average wage is on the left-hand side, um, and we're seeing major disparities in wages by race and ethnicity. Um, and so this is... Um, for the Columbus, Georgia region, Georgia, the state, and then the U.S., and then the counties within the MSA, looking at this gap and um, these really stark disparities between Black and African American workers and white workers. Um, and then the right-hand side is showing um, job growth for uh, BIPOC and non-BIPOC workers. And then we are also able to compare industry data to workforce data. Um, and this is super useful for understanding where gaps might exist between education requirements um, of jobs and then the educational attainment of job holders, or excuse me, of, of um, not necessarily job holders, but people living in that geography. Um, and so this is showing for uh, the Columbus, Georgia region and the U.S. Um, by education level where, where the gaps are and um, what the gaps are. So, for example, for some college or associate's degree, you see that um, educational attainment um, exceeds the education requirement, um, and then vice versa for the bachelor's degree in Columbus. And, um, a couple more examples um, where we're able to leverage some of the algorithms that we developed in W to solve other data sets as well. So, here you're looking at um, USDA data of the census of agriculture and address various uh, in that data. Um, and this sort of little two by two just gives a sense of um, a national scale. And you can also sort of zoom in and see you know, specific county uh, might be by specialty crops. Uh, And then um, here, this is a sort of a framework um, on the food cluster that really is going from uh, um, sort of mapping out the full food supply chain, you know, from inputs to the farm, uh, the farm all the way to the table and retail. Um, and it basically reflects a combination of both USDA and agriculture data and then um, paired with our QCW data. So go through these quickly to get a sense of some of the farm inputs on an industry basis and some of the strengths um, and weaknesses in the Mid-South Delta region of the U.S. And next, looking at the agricultural data, seeing uh, what specific commodities are strengths and weaknesses um, throughout that region. And finally, arriving at the food cluster, um, manufacturing and processing subclusters so within that box, and then to the right, uh, some of the sort of retail food. A newer application for this data is um, we are currently in the process of developing a national county database with MIT and the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. Um, to create um, economic typologies of the U.S. counties, all, you know, 3,100-something U.S. counties. Um, and so the goal of doing this is to, like, really expand our understanding of how economic factors impact health outcomes. Um, so basically using the typologies of the foundation for um, assessing the impact of economic factors on, um, you know, not only health factors, but ultimately health outcomes using um, the University of Wisconsin's county health rankings. Another more recent uh, application is actually providing support to uh, multiple capital investment process. So it's uh, 
basically taking all of our data found data and leveraging it to create sort of the uh, the next generation of um, and you know pulling in all this economic data and also uh, demographic, socioeconomic, and uh, financial data. Um, the goal is to create this place based um, sort of guest investment that really invest in often overlooked economies, uh, distressed areas, and then also have a focus on uh, MWBE opportunities. And then um, lastly, right, we are also working on creating a website um, to sort of enable a range of customers to you know, quickly and easily directly purchase uh, the QCW um, all the data and also the other data sets as well. Um, not quite not shown here, but like also organizing uh, all the data into different modules by the type of data um, and related indicators and data and variables as well. Uh, by a little bit of a uh, you know one stop shop um, to provide a picture of different sort of topics um, ranging from agriculture to uh, capital and lending activity to what you see here um, with uh, industry and industry cluster data. Um, thank you all for so much for your time and uh, do feel free to reach out to either myself or Aaron or uh, our website. And uh, thanks and have a nice rest of the afternoon.